What's up, everybody? It is Thursday, 1030 Eastern. It is time for Thinking on Paper. Welcome, guys. I'm Jeremy Gilbertson. Along with me, Mark Fielding. Mark, how are you, sir? I'm really good today. I managed to go snowboarding this morning, so my my head is is clean and ready to go. Let the jealousy ensue. Thank you for that, Mark. Uh, (laughs) I love it. I love it. Mark, why don't you uh, introduce our guest who, um, who shall we say, there are two sides to the story, if you will. Yeah, many sides. So um, welcome, Rich Teller, we have today. And w- when I first discovered Rich um, and his his work, I was, like you, Jeremy, a little bit confused. I felt like the whole world was kind of like in some kind of Truman Show joke where I wasn't part of the joke is like it was just so it, it the story of Richard Hart and Hex and the Hexicans and then before that Skook it, it was so ludicrous that it was I, I couldn't believe it it was like fiction is stranger than fact or fact is stranger than fiction it was a prime example um and finally we have the man here we're going to speak about bit joinery the Hexagons his new film collaborative filmmaking in web3 um, the spectrum of decentralization, the spectrum of scams. I don't think there's anybody who quite knows about the spectrum of scams more than Rich perhaps does. So yeah, looking forward to unpacking it all. So um, let's pass it over to the man, Rich Teller. Welcome. Thank you kindly. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the opportunity to chat. Obviously, like I said in the post, this is a, a rare occurrence for me. Usually, I do um, public stuff in character. <laughs> so yeah i'm happy to have a chat about what i've been up to and you know it's been a long a long haul over the last few years a lot of different things have been happening over the last few years so i'm happy to answer any questions you guys have got and you know we can we can dig deep into the into the behind the scenes of the, the productions and where we're at today but um yeah i mean why don't we, <laughs> I'm why no, don't we start with your your you said you mostly used to doing interviews as your in character you do the questioning normally so why don't we start with tom gillespie who is this alter ego your other character tom gillespie yeah so tom gillespie was born out of um another character that i developed some four four or five years ago now called bitman 360 um i basically i created this fake influencer a youtuber called bitman360 and i was sort of making videos on youtube and messing around on social media with this with this character and, and i think six months to a year or something passed by and i was like what the hell am i up to with this um and rather than like just put it to bed i sat down and i wrote the the fake influencer film and in that film i, I this is where tom gillespie was born i needed somebody to investigate this uh, fake influence of bitman 360 so tom gillespie was basically born out of bitman 360 and yeah they both go heads to head in the fake influence of film so that that's kind of like the origin story of the characters everything emanates from from scooter coin and bitman 360 basically um of which there is a catalog of his earlier stuff <laughs> on youtube so so let's that's that's awesome let's back up just a hair and and get a little bit of background on you rich because you you you're a storyteller you're a filmmaker you you have this curiosity to understand um the inner workings of what's happening in the crypto space uh shedding light on things that you know people don't necessarily want to have light shed upon um give me a little background on, on you just in general yeah, I basically I studied fine art at university, specialized in uh, filmmaking, but with it, sort of installations. So, you know, I'd build rooms with, using projectors and monitors and what have you and have people basically sort of wrapped around the work and sort of I wrote my thesis on something called hypnopedia, which is like basically the art of sleep learning and that was kind of my whole mo um that in tandem with sort of a critical perspective on uh, the effects of television on kids so th- that was kind of my combination of interests that created um sort of my, my my work my earlier creative works if you like 
And then I took a hiatus, went backpacking for like nearly five years and saw the world um, and ended up in Sweden. And here I have, have a little uh, video production company called Telephoto and that sort of pays the bills. And on the side, I've been working with BitJoin Studios, um, yeah, which started as a, a YouTube channel itself where that was back in 2014. Essentially, I was like, I think I spent about a year looking at Bitcoin 2013 to 2014. I was like, this can't, is this, is this for real? Um, so what I did is I took an uh, online course at the University of Nicosia. Uh, it was like 12 weeks intensive. And at the end of that, I was like, okay, this is, this shit's real. Um, I, you know, I need to sort of go deeper on this. And one way that I did that was taking my camera, heading into the city and finding companies, startups and interviewing the founders and getting their sort of like, what do they believe about what's going to happen? Right. And that's how BitJoin started as a YouTube channel. Fast forward to, you know, 2017, 2018 or something, BitJoin Studios and went, moved into the filmmaking, the documentary stuff as well. So I think that's a loose background. I probably hopped over a few things. <laughs> no, that's Some amazing. Interesting things to unpack there, though, aren't there, Jeremy? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, TV absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Quick, quick shout outs to folks in the chat. Linus, Snow Styler, Mark Calamia. What's up, guys? Thanks for joining. As always, um, Rich, where my mind goes, and I know Mark probably has some questions for you. Five years backpacking. So, what? Give me, <laughs> give me one. Give me one interesting aha moment that came to you as you were walking, <laughs> walking through the world. Cause I know space sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times we need space for things to kind of coalesce in our heads for our next step for, our, you know, where we're going next. Like what, what was a, what was a key pivotal uh, outcome of that experience for you? Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, it was a really long time ago now, but I'm, I just, I really, I really enjoyed, you know, meeting people from different backgrounds. Um, you get you get like a sort of broader view of the world when you when you hang out with people from all over the world. And I mean, I was mainly down in Oz, New Zealand, what have you. Backpackers, obviously, they're f they're not full of Oz Australians and New Zealanders. They're full of Germans, Dutch, uh, Israelis, you know, South Africans. So when you live with people in, in, in backpackers for extended periods of time and you work together, we work the banana paddocks, which is a hell of a job. Um, you know, you're out there at 5 a.m. in the morning in the, in the pissing down raid, you know, humping bananas with, with all kinds of folks from around the world. It's, it's like you just sit. You, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a, many, a few moments there where you're just like, this is probably as hard as it's going to get, right? I mean, those humping bananas you're talking 80 kilos and you're you, you know you're shifting upwards of 300 of those a day and you've got like an italian dude here you've got a south korean guy there everyone's trying to communicate in broken english and you're just hoping that machete doesn't take your head off when he when he hits the tree right so i think it, i think it's that kind of I, I mean just being in living and working together with people from so many different backgrounds was, you know, immensely val valuable, I think. <laughs> Amazing. It? Go ahead, Mark. I just wouldn't, I, I, what, what was it? You say five years is a long time traveling. What was it that pulled you out of that? Was it that the fake flincer, does this correspond with that time? Or was it? Was no, no, it no, no. We're, we're, going about, we're going about like 10, over 10 years. Um, so I've, I've been in Sweden for like, yeah, 10, maybe 10 years now. Um, and obviously I ended up here because my, my, my partner is from here. So, um, we met in Australia, uh, some, yeah, you know, 12, 13 years ago or something. So it was, a uh, yeah, I wasn't making film. I mean, actually now I think back, I was making films in New Zealand. Um, but you know, I was shooting stuff on, on my phone playing around with the uh, on the laptop with final cut or iMovie early days so i knew i knew i kind of knew what i wanted to get into it just took a wee while to get there <laughs> you know sometimes it does right. little little experiments little journeys along the way is kind of this kind of the process that i've always followed and it's been fun um so so you you started um kind of as uh, crypto kind of first spun up while you kind of were were 
interviewing people, like talking to folks, knowing that, hey, this is probably going to be a new thing. This is going to be kind of where we're headed in a certain respect, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about how that transitioned into, hey, we need to use story to tell this yeah. rather than talking head. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go back to 2014, um, 2013, uh, I was talking to about crypto. I mean, it was really just Bitcoin, Litecoin, Doge, whatever. Um, and there was still like a heavy scam narrative, you know, laundering, all the dirty underground conversation was mainstream back then. And I was like, after going out and interviewing heaps and heaps of founders who were like genuinely building stuff that was, you know, growing this ecosystem, like infrastructure and everything, um, I I figured if I could put these people in front of the camera and ask them some decent questions and then present this material to the general public, like even my parents or people around me that were like, Rich, you know, you need to stay away from that stuff. It's, it's like dark web money, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, but look, there's real human beings here building stuff. You know, this is a real thing. Here's human beings talking about what they're building and what they believe about what they're building. And, and for me, that was kind of like me pushing back, I guess, um, against constantly being uh, associated or having my interests associated with this dark web economy at that time. And maybe there were some seeds planted back then that influenced the filmmaking that I've been doing over the last few years. I, I'd imagine so. Yeah, that's that's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I And I can relate to like trying to explain what's happening in Web3, what's happening with cryptocurrency, what's happening with blockchain and, and how that relates to everything else. Because a lot of people, you mentioned the word blockchain or Web3, people are like, oh, that's that Silk Road fake money kind of stuff and you're like no wait a minute let's take let's take a couple more steps and unpack it a little bit what what is the what is the what's kind of the first key um demystifier that you find yourself running to first when you're explaining that there's some underlying value into all the stuff that people are talking about with this tech um well going back to back 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 then i i used to sort of explain it as a new sort of internet um, and uh, like with a, with an economic like layer, like a value layer. Um, and I mean, I think fast forward to now, obviously we're calling it web three, aren't we? So to some extent that was kind of accurate, but I think that was the most simple, simplified way that I could explain it to people at that time was we're just, we're basically looking at a new type of internet. And yeah, I think, I think that, does that answer your question? <laughs> It does. It does. And, and kind of um, kind of going on that a little bit, the where where I always get I kind of chuckle a little bit is when when people you know are trying to relate the the digital currency space to what we know about money. It's kind of like when a new song comes out, you always relate it to an old song. You go, hey, that sounds like these guys. Right. So, hey, cryptocurrency, it sounds like this thing, but it's a little different. But it's money out of nothing. It's ones and zeros. But then what's a bank account? I haven't seen a stack of cash in a, like physically in a while. Right. Uh, are, are we throwing gold bars at each other anymore? You know, uh, I was pretty spend, interesting. Try spending cash in Sweden. Everyone will. Uh, Every time people look at you like you're from another planet, it's it's almost it's the same over here. Yeah. <laughs> the well, let's society. yeah, let's let's talk about this. Uh, let's talk about this um, this newer project that's that's out. Mark, I think you've been all the way through it. I've seen bits and pieces of it. Uh, Mark, where what did you? What was your reaction to it initially, and uh, how do you want to explore it further with Rich? So we were talking about the hexagons, and I think for people who are watching this, some will know, some won't know. So perhaps if we start with Richard Hart and Hex, which is the, the two the two main storylines of the hexagons, who is Richard Hart and what is Hex, and what what made you want to investigate um, the man and the the, the, the coin Hex? But first of all, I'd argue that the main storyline is that is hex. I mean, it's in the title. Hexagons is it's the community, right? Um, because without community, most cryptocurrencies are just there's nothing. So I'd argue that uh, the main, yeah. He although Richard and and his and his coin, his token are obviously prevalent in the storyline. A lot of the focus was 
put on, and you'll see that reflected in the interviews uh, with the with the hexagons um, themselves, was put on what the what the community themselves believe about both hex and you know the broader com uh, crypto community. And um, so I um, didn't choose to investigate hex or have the character choose to investigate hex. At the end of the fake fluence, uh, off the back of that, I um, put up a vote on on the website, and then I invited. At that time, it was uh, Bit Nation and Hex were basically like that was the vote, and 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 the Hex vote won out. So the Hexkins have obviously piled in, and they voted to you know to to have Tom go and investigate Hex. So it wasn't actually you know my decision. To, to a certain extent, it was the hexagons themselves by by the vote. Um, but Richard himself is a big character. He's been around since the start of Bitcoin many, many years, and he's a big character as well. He's, you know, anyone who's been been in crypto for for a while will will have heard of him. And because of what he did with uh, his launch of Hex, uh, hijacking the Bitcoin brand, I believe, because uh, initially it was called Bitcoin Hex. Uh, that pissed a lot of people off, a lot of Bitcoiners. And he, you know, if, as as you'll see in the in the in the mini series as, itself, he was a Bitcoin OG um, way back then as well. So the idea that he kind of, I guess the the original co community felt a little bit disrespected or pissed off at, at his decision to to um, to launch Bitcoin Hex back then um when it comes to hex the token itself i'm not here to sell it to anybody definitely not financial advice so i'm i'm steering clear you do your own homework if you want to know what it is okay <laughs> it, it's funny that you, you well it's not funny it's it's interesting that you 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 speak about community and obviously it's one of the buzzwords of web3 is community in in the in the in the mini series tom gillespie actually speaks about um religiosity of hex and the hexagons and how there is a almost a religious infatuation with with it and is that what you think was is, is richard hart created that has that just come from the community building it themselves like what is the the driving force behind it why are yeah, they I mean, so there is, there is a you know there is a method for starting a cult right we we see it repeatedly. There's a recipe, so I think he followed followed the standard recipe probably, and um, yeah, it seems like the first protocol was obviously enriching the early adopters, uh, of which you know you can you you can see those those guys online, which are identified as God whales or whales. They have um they have like different titles or names for the, for different segments of the community so they're not all like like with any crypto project there is a often the you know communities talk talked about as if it's one united whole and it really isn't it's typically divided up into different uh, categories that have different roles and responsibilities much like um a cult leader would do <laughs> with or a religious leader would do right um, look at the catholic church for example yeah, it's really interesting if you if you pull things back to to kind of first principles, you know, even the state of religion and and what it is uh is 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 kind of rooted in this in this fear and security kind of seesaw, right? That you know, by being a part of that, you know, group of people, there's a bit of security to it, but also there are rules that keep you in place and if you do the wrong thing, you could be ousted from that. So there's the there's the fear balance. And that's, that's almost as interesting and as critical to the, to the storytelling as a bit of the hero's journey, which you know, use a storyteller and, and filmmaker, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of can relate to that. Um, yeah. Was There's what, lot, cause yeah. The cult, the cult of the cult of personality is all over crypto though, isn't it? I mean, it's, you have five or six starts with Satoshi, doesn't it? You have CZ, you have Vitalik, you have these, personalities that bring people in keep people in and drive the the development of the ecosystems around them don't they i mean it's it's everywhere 
And I think I think what Tom has learned on his journey, and again, the reason for that character's existence really is to like function as a vehicle for the audience to travel from from the regular economy into the crypto economy. And everything that he learns along the way, the audience learns with him. And now, you know, um, most recently, he's he's starting his own sort of uh, project as well, this collective DAO, studio DAO type structure called the Bit Joinery. But I mean, going back. Bitman was Bitman 360 was the head of his own cult as well with Scooter Coin, and what was what what's fantastic about that as well is, and I think Linus might well you you mentioned him before. I guess he's in the audience. Is that while I was making the fake fluence, or or maybe just prior to um, Scooter Coin was a complete fabrication. Like you can go and watch back <laughs> Bitman's videos. Scooter Coin didn't exist at that point, and Linus went and brought it to life and made it a real thing. And it was a it was a mineable coin, and there were at one point. You know, there were liquidity pools. There was people mining it. I even myself mined it for a wee while as well. Um, so it was, it was kind of like, yeah, stranger than fiction, right? It was like <laughs> you you create these kind of mad ideas that start in this kind of just yeah with the words on paper, right? Or um or a script, and suddenly they manifest. They become somebody out there <laughs> build makes the thing real. Um, and what we were hoping, or what we started thinking of at that time was, okay, what's the application of Scooter Coin, right? Is it just going to be another shit coin, meme coin? Um, no, we gave it, an, you know, we built a device, the Buttercup 3, or, or Bitman built the Buttercup 3 device, which was a, like a genuine innovation. It was like, currently it's referred to as move to earn. So if you, <laughs> if you, if you see today there's things like Sweat Coin, and some other coins where you're, you know, you're motivated to to earn by by moving. This was some of the stuff, the ideas that we were playing around with, you know, five years ago, whatever, whatever. So, so I love the idea that a film can be like an incubator for startups or products itself. You can launch products within this fantasy world. I was like, this is this is really really kind of fun to see things come to life like that. Uh, you know, just. Not, not not without pushing them or finding VC funding or anything like that or having a pitch deck, none of that. It's just, here's a film. Now it's real, and this is where it comes. This is where we come full full circle to the speculative fiction, right? Um, which is what I at that time didn't realize what we were practicing essentially. Real quick before we dive deeper into the speculative fiction thing, uh, I. So I wanted to learn more about this buttercup. I don't know much about it. Is it like a like a step in, like a dustlin runner kind of thing where there's it's it's like a I mean the kids that ride their scooters at the skate park, they're doing, you know, tail whips and you know, grind fifty fifties, whatever down the rails. And the idea was that this little device would plug would sit on the handlebars like a you know, like a like a uh, like a lamp or something clip on and it would be able to it would have some logic inside it that would be able to tell what trick was being done by the kid and this was, to earn. <laughs> yeah i mean it could apply to a skateboard or a bmx or whatever right and um so every the idea was like every time the kids go down hit the park you know they love what they do this was kind of a way for them to go pro without actually going pro so they could actually get paid to play um, and the, the whole concept was the device would recognize, okay, he's just done something he's never done before. Like give this guy, give this kid two, 300 scooter coins. Congratulations. Right. And obviously on the other side, there was a store where he could buy like new wheels, new bearings, new grips, whatever he needed using scooter coins. So this is like nice closed world. And, and we see this emerging today. There's a bunch of apps that are doing similar things, right? How did how did it rec how did it recognize a new motion or a oh, new you'd trick? To, you'd have to quiz Linus on on that part of things. Okay. We, um, I, it, there was like accelerometers with it inside and some some chips and logic, and it would sync with the app, and it would have some, you know, it would know what you were capable of and rank you and, and understand, um, you know, your base level as a, as a scooter. But I mean, That's as I cool. say, it was based in fantasy at the time. And I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't scooter. I'm, I come from a skateboarding background myself. So. <laughs> well, you know, where my head goes, and I always tend to push, you know, a, a cool idea into like crazy land a little bit. But um, 
what if there was a way to take that knowing the motion and you create, say Mark creates a new trick on his snowboard, right? He was out today and he did some kind of new motion that's never been done before, right? What if there was a way to attribute ownership to that motion and lock it in, in some sort of, you know, mocked path? Like that could be, that could be really that interesting. Would, that would give him some street cred for sure. But in it terms of like would, license, yeah. licensing rights or like, how would you, yeah, you want to, every time someone hits that trick in the future, you get a pay like a payout. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or 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 when the when the EA snowboard game comes out, like the Mark Fielding triple doozy uh is licensed into the game as a motion. I don't know. A anyway, that's we 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 go down, but uh uh looks like it's secret patented scooter coin tech is how it all works. So thanks for sharing that uh in there. Yeah, oh, yeah, and also Linus uh Linus is a good friend of mine and um recently turned scooter coin into a proof of stake coin so it wasn't it was a proof of work coin i think the end of middle of last year it became a proof of stake coin um, and it's it's basically a fork of litecoin or it was a fork of litecoin now it's god knows but uh <laughs> god knows where it is <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere it, it's alive it just um there's no yeah there's no community because this you know the scooterers don't know about it yet i guess we're getting big up on the park, but like it's it's I, it's it sounds much more big in Japan fun, <laughs> the, the fun than stepping and a lot of these move to earn platforms. I like the idea of yeah, ride to earn. Well, oh, I think it's, the... it's gonna happen, it's only a matter of time. But I mean yeah. it obviously it does need attention, which Bitman is not giving it. Yeah, I think that the, the big thing to any kind of activation like this is is you have to have that bridge from this digital experience into what's happening in the real world and how it translates and have have that bridge be a way to pull people into digital uh but also do it the other way around right so activate it at parks and stuff but we're getting big ups on scooter coin as a name uh in in the chat and the threads so guys <laughs> keep pushing keep pushing that yeah well you never know maybe it gets a new lease of life through the big joinery so i mean that's probably better structured for realizing it in fact now that well, I think that, that's that. a good said that's a good segue so Jeremy the DAO is your your domain so it, it, what what's the bit joinery and how can how does it fit into to your to your bigger filmmaking vision yeah so the bit joinery is basically an evolution of the bit join of bit join studios um and originally I was like pushing it from that perspective but then I realized well maybe it should be Tom's thing. So I think at the end of last year, just before the hex docker came out, uh, handed it over to him and he, and he basically is running with it now. Um, and it's right. It's run on uncut on the back end for managing the assets. And essentially like a little bit like what we did when we moved from fake fluence to the hexagons There's a voting mechanism, but this time, of course, um, if you go to the bit you'll see there's a bunch of NFTs that you can, uh, basically meant to vote and the idea is that say one of those one of those projects there's eight of them at the moment one of say one of them mints out um completely at that point you know this project is the next documentary production for tom to go and investigate and those people that uh mint that mint those tokens because they want to see this uh this project investigated become sort of stakeholders in the uh the result the resulting production uh, and then within the bit joiner itself there's something called non-fungible mates which are essentially co-producers and these are the people that actually uh take take the funds raised through through mint the, the minting of those votes in in the treasury they take that accumulated fund and they use it to produce uh, the investigation documentary so that you can think of those as like yeah you know the crew the the core team of the of the next production and it's obviously published out as an nft the final production itself and then using uncut we basically manage all the i guess call them dividends or royalties or whatever you want to call them uh the kickbacks done via that specific production nft to both those people that voted, you know, with their with their minting, with their cash, fraction is is kicked back to those guys. 
there's a, a fraction kick back to the the, the founders, the co-producers, and then also back to the treasury as well for you know to start the whole cycle again. And the the hope is that this generates some sort of perpetual production machine in which everybody is kind of satisfied in terms of getting paid to to build these documentaries, create these documentaries, as well as um, you know having sort of sort of royalties in per perpetuity after the fact as well for many many resulting sales of the full production nft if that makes sense i know it's, it's maybe a lot to just digest there but it makes no. sense in my head at least no it totally it totally makes sense and it's and it's a great model that we're seeing across different executions uh in in space and from a DAO perspective it's it's interesting because you could come into that community and you could submit an id like you said submit hey i I saw this community over here. I, I it seems a little scammy. Like, what's going on? There seems to be an interesting thread in it. You guys look at it. You go, "Hey, this could be a really interesting story for for Tom to investigate." And then the machine kind of keeps keeps kicking. The one thing about DAOs that, and I'm a, I'm a big believer. I'm I'm a founder and uh, and uh, uh, member of the Lyricist Lounge DAO. We started about a year ago, and we're we're just now figuring out um, how to. Uh, kind of capture and automate superpowers, so to speak, of the participants of the DAO, and then also elevate the people uh, who are putting putting the work in, right? Because as humans, we always come together when something launches. It's like, oh yeah, we're in, let's do it. And there's this big amount of activity. And then all of a sudden, when it comes time to actually doing a lot of the real lifting, you know, we, we see it kind of wavering, but there's always one or two people in there that are willing to lean in, right? So how have you, how have you found that? And how have you found ways to identify and elevate those folks that are really leaning into stuff? Well, it's still early days, um, but I can tell you that <clears throat> all the pieces of the puzzle in, are in place. The tools, uh, the application of, of the entire model is actually all there in working order. It's just a little bit messy at the moment, um, and so that adds the confusion. Um, but essentially, there are you know there are two types of people that want to see the Bitjoinery succeed, and that's people that want to support by filling the treasury essentially by by voting or getting helping you know grow get other people to vote, um, but they don't want to actually create the production. And but then then there's the other crew. Um, the people that want to kind of come in and be part of the putting putting all the pieces of puzzle together the production crew or co-producers if you like um and it's sort of right now it's kind of like we've got this uh telegram group which is kind of like on the on the sort of outer peripheries and within that group we're trying to sort of identify who wants to come in deeper and, and become a co-producer with tom or help tom go and investigate something, right? But we can't get to that step until we uh, basically vote out or mint out the one of the vote collections. Um, because I, I strongly believe that, well, I really, really desire, you know, want people to get paid for, for their work on the production, as well as owning the rights to their, you know, to their cut of the, uh, cut of the revenues on 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 the on the post-production or the, the full production nft so they this idea that and you see it all over the place with DAOs. i mean i've been i mean arguably in way too many but there's there's a hell of a lot of let's all sort of do the you know put in the grunt work or this sweat equity or whatever you want to call it now and it's going to pay off later on and i i don't i don't want to go down that route i was like no we're going to we, once we start this machine, which, yeah, the hardest part is to get it started, obviously, um, people are, are going to be able to tap into this treasury on the first production, and we're going to be able to feed ourselves and those people that helped us get to this point and the treasury itself to get to the next production until we kind of fix this perpetual production machine. But, I mean, it, yeah, it's a mammoth amount of work, and, I'm, you know, Tom's doing it. Uh, you know, I'm doing it in character as well. <laughs> so, it, it yeah, it, it gets a little bit tricky when, you know, you've put this additional 
layer of a, of a fictional character going through the motions as well. But I can tell you for, for sure, there's a lot of support for, for what Tom's doing. I mean, you can see at cryptoscandemic.com, uh, he's, you know, he's done a whole heap of media appearances and what have you and live streams and what have you. So people seem to appreciate what he's done up to this point. Um, I think that I think that's another aspect as well. The fact that we already have a feature film and a mini series, so you know we got a proof of concept, so we can see okay, what's Tom capable of? Let's put him through the motions. We can see he's he's capable of this. You know, it, it should make it a little bit easier to kickstart the first cycle of um, of the bit joinery. But honestly, this kind of stuff will unfold over years, not months, probably, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Love it. I probably so you... and I think, but I hope I answered your question. No, Wait, it's so... great. And it kind of last week we had this collaborative storytelling, and this is collaborative filmmaking. And uh, like you said, it's very v important that we understand it's going to take years, not weeks. It's not going to. It's going to take some time to get it to, to work. And it sounds like you look. You may, maybe you've made a mistake by hand, handing it over to Tom Gillespie. You need to get in there as well. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, I don't, but also, I, yeah, I, I personally want to steer away from shilling and hyping NFTs. Essentially, you know, it's it's tiresome. So you won't catch Tom out there going buy my voting, buy my mint my vote NFTs. You know, let me airdrop this, do this, do that. I don't need to take the character down that road. I think he can be a bit more civilized. And I think that's how you gain res or build respect within the character over time as well, um, because this this does this will take time. So why blow it all now? And I mean, even if we mint out um, one of the votes in in a week or you know sixty seconds or whatever you see in the headlines, you know, uh, what then? You know, wh why is it so necessary that it needs to be everything really fast? You know, and I think all that stuff is uh, overwhelming and a bit exhausting. And, and uh, again, it's often associated with rugging, you know, and scams as well. And just, um, well, I you think... just, yeah, you just let the work and, and the mission kind of speak for itself, right. And what you guys are building. And if people want to participate in that mission, that's awesome. And that's how it goes. Um, yeah. But th th there's another challenge. That's the other challenge is like uh, some, if you're not familiar with how to manage a bunch of people, <laughs> Uh, especially if, if it's like this kind of structure where you don't know, like everyone's kind of pseudonymous essentially. <laughs> so you don't know if there are people in there to just cause harm or are they actually genuinely interested or are they just like undercover operatives for another DAO trying to fuck with your, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you don't, you don't know. So yeah, that's, there's additional challenges with sort of with that. And um, so there's definitely. there's no vetting that you're not you don't have a vetting process there because I've, I've explored a couple of other DAOs and they're they're gated to producers or directors or writers and they have to they, yeah they have to they have a vetting process to prove that they're not well I, um, I think that I think that's what would eventually occur with this uh, co-producer NFT once it gets to that stage right um, you can apply all kinds of sort of logic on on the, on those NFTs later on I mean. Um, if, if you set the bar high enough, for example, right now you have to, I think you have to hit a certain threshold to be able to access one of these NFTs. It's not a lot of money, but it's still, you know, it's a sufficient amount that most people that want to muck with your mess with your operation are not going to do. That's already a sort of a way to sort of validate. And then you can just add some additional logic to those and make, you know, to those NFTs to make gated stuff but personally i'm really not a fan of uh gating token gating content um that's maybe just something personal that i need to get over i don't know depends on the, how the, how the thing evolves but putting stuff but putting hiding stuff away behind gated walls gated i just feel like it's very web too <laughs> you know uh we already have king all these kingdoms kingdom facebook <laughs> They were like, now we're going to have, you know, tens of thousands or millions of more of these kingdoms, these micro kingdoms with the little dictators at the top. I don't know. It doesn't feel like the right path to me. 
So question, question for you related to kind of Tom's next steps. And, you know, when you and you and Tom are sitting at your board meeting, kind of like, you know, Napoleon Hill's council of invisible advisors working on your next steps. Right. Um, what, when are, when are we going to see Tom start investigating virtual worlds and digital experiences actually dropping in and walking around and, you know, calling, calling on those experiences versus, um, versus strictly just kind of the, the, uh, the blockchain aspects of it. Are you going that route at any time soon? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. You mean, are you referring to the met metaverse or? Yeah, I, I, I try to steer clear of the M word. He doesn't want to bit. say the yeah. metaverse. He means the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. So, so like you have these, you know, wilder world sandbox, Decentraland. I mean, imagine Tom popping into like Decentraland and, poking around and being like, Hey, there's actually nothing going on in here. Or, Hey, I found this corner of the world. That's amazing. You guys should come hang out. Like almost like an entertainment tonight, but for digital experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, um, I mean, it was, I think it was last week. He, I was, he, uh, he was into central land wandering around looking for some film festival or something. And there was like nobody in there and he tweeted out, you know, I think the 40, 42 Americans that are usually here are asleep or something. You know, it, it is a ghost town in a lot of these metaverses. Yeah. What's interesting is there's, there's so many of them launching. Um, and even the one that's supposedly valued at $40 billion or whatever has is, is only got, you know, a few hundred subscribers or something. Like, that's the thing with digital, right, is you can inflate the numbers, you can fake influence a lot of things through the, through this digital filter so um one thing i did want to do with bitman 360 largely because i you know I, well i lost the wig and i also obviously don't have long hair anymore <laughs> was to take him fully uh, fully digital fully virtual um and keep developing that character in in that world um, and eventually tom could probably follow down follow down that path as well uh, and that's something that's still on the table to be honest because um yeah bitman needs to remain kind of youthful and i like the idea of also just sort of finding an aussie voice actor to to take to take this character and run with him in the virtual world uh, as as you know maybe develop out the scooter maybe it's more realistic to develop out the scooter coin and the buttercup three device in in the virtual world i can imagine could, it a lot more easier to apply to the, than a hardware device that could be really cool that could be really cool. Well, hey, uh, I want to be mindful of time. We're kind of approaching the tail end of of, of our discussion. Um, Mark, do you did you want to did you want to try and uh, try and run your hot buttons down, or where do you have any kind of last minute questions that we want to run through? Yeah, so maybe not some hot buttons, but um, <clears throat> just for the people who haven't actually seen Tom Gillespie, and one of the things which, when I came into it, I thought it was I didn't realize how educational it is. And I know that there's a big narrative about educating the masses about crypto and blockchain and NFTs. And, and he does an incredible job of making it complex things understandable. It's very educational. So that was, if anyone wants a, a funny way to learn a bit more, I, I recommend that. Um, but not a question about how you, you've spoken about you and Tom and me and him and them. And I know that Tom has a presence on LinkedIn and Twitter and you have a presence and how do, how, how does Rich manage Tom? Like how, how, on a personal level, how do you manage that um, alter ego second character part of your life? Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a challenge at times, but essentially I have, um, you know, a browser, a browser with multiple um, accounts. So there's, you know, I just, I can basically pull up Tom on one screen whenever. Um, and then depending on like what time, if there's a lot going on, I'll put some of the accounts on my phone. If I need to, you know, for example, with Twitter spaces, you can only use it on your phone. If you want to be heard, you can't use it on the desktop. Um, that's externally, or you know, on the screens and the devices, but internally, um, I recall at the beginning of the fake fluence of this adventure, I met with a, a, a local Swedish um, director, a woman 
called Shashti, and she she said you have to be very careful when you are doing this kind of thing because obviously you can develop some sort of <laughs> <laughs> mental issues. And I, you know, I just constantly remind me, remind myself of you know Tom is a fictional digital, you know, primarily digital character that lives in all these various social media accounts um and just to make sure you keep the division uh, you know at one point um i was keeping them on you know i had different devices there was like my stuff bitman stuff and tom so just actual different physical devices was helpful and now um yeah i think i you know i've been doing it for a few years so i'm getting pretty good at it now and like i say i don't dream i don't have dreams <laughs> or anything as Tom Gillespie or any of that kind of stuff. Um, more from like sort of the director's perspective on how to utilize these characters to 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 do what I want to want to do, which is what you just described. Um, is kind of use entertainment and comedy to educate on some of these more boring subjects that are related to finance and technology that most people just switch off at. Right. This idea that crypto is only for getting rich quick, um, I think, is, is, is an idea that's run its course. And that's not not one I want to prom promote, but I, I mean, I'm not a trader, so I don't get a kick out of <laughs> looking at charts and making technical analysis. I find all that stuff extremely boring. The culture, the cultural stuff, heaps heaps more interesting. Yeah, totally agree. That's that's awesome, Rich. This is one. this has been such a cool conversation and really cool way to end on uh, that question because there there's got to be an interesting balance. But the the important part too is we all relate to story like all of us as humans relate to stories and story started like way way back it's how we communicate it's how we communicate history and what happened and even way before tech right so the most interesting stories come from uh different perspectives right and you're creating this different perspective to to explore and see the world in and i i think it's awesome and i, I keep me posted on what's going on with the dow and the next projects and feel free to throw in the chat you know, the, if you haven't already links and, and stuff to all your work and what's upcoming, but, uh, it's been fascinating for me, Rich. Thanks for joining. Uh, Mark, any thoughts, final comments? Yeah. I, I just I remember what you just said, Jeremy, it's been fascinating. And I think that we've really only just began, so maybe we should get you back on and, um, speak to us some more. Absolutely. Um, yeah super happy to have the opportunity to speak as myself for a change i think like i said i think this might be the second or third time i've done done so so proper behind the scenes uh director's cut stuff <laughs> coming out here yeah. that's, that's yeah. a scoop for us jeremy <laughs> yes absolutely 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 well guys thanks for joining um we'll have some big news on some upcoming guests over the next couple of weeks we also have some other announcements coming up that we'll be sharing. We actually have a LinkedIn channel now that's uh, that's our LinkedIn account for Thinking on Paper that we'll be starting to publish uh, some stuff there. But uh, hit us up if you guys have any ideas on guests or topics or things you want us to do a little research a la Tom Gillespie. Um, and we'll keep it going. Thanks for watching, guys. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye.